Good afternoon. I'm Mark Allen with Gaber.io. New teeth. Um, and I'm here today with Chris Bonatti, the founder and CEO of Bedrock AI. Good afternoon, Chris. How are you doing? I'm great. How about you, Mark? I'm doing really well. Thank you. So, so to start with, can you just share a brief background of yourself and your work history? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I started out my career as a CPA. Uh, so I worked at KPMG in financial statement audits, mining, great stuff, um, and transitioned into software development and data, uh, did a master's degree in that, um, and ultimately ended up uh, you know, working as a Python programming instructor uh, and as a data scientist in, in the field of corporate governance advisory. Um, so... Uh, an unusual career trajectory, particularly for a data scientist, uh, but I, I'm really passionate about, about programming and, uh, and stats. So uh, it's, it's been fun. And, and that um, sort of confluence of, of interests, both on the, the machine learning programming side and the finance side has led to some interesting things. Very cool. And, and what yeah. was something we have in common, I'm a Python developer. Look at that. I was actually writing Python this morning. So, so and I understand what, where Python comes in with ML and AI too. So that brings us to Bedrock AI now. So what does Bedrock AI do? Um, who do you do it for? And I mean, basically, what service do you provide? Yeah, so Bedrock AI is, is software that extracts hard to find information from public company filings. So think of a, of a 10K annual report. Um, so we're extracting information in, in really long, complex, complicated financial text um, and showing it to institutional investors so they can see risks and understand you know, the fundamentals of the business uh, before it's too late, before uh, the stock uh, it reacts. Uh, interesting. So are you saying that public companies sometimes try to hide things in their 10 case? <laughs> <laughs> what? Come uh, on. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think, you know, something for people who aren't aware of, of what a 10K is or what it looks like, you know, um, people are aware that generally companies put up, put out annual reports, but, mm. you know, the amount of long form textual filings that public companies are actually putting out into the marketplace, I think would astound most retail investors and, and most, you know, lay people in general. It, it's not just the 10K. Um, there's, there's quarterly reports, there's management information circulars, there's 8Ks, there's, there's just a slew of, of forms and most of them are really, really long. And, and you know, even the, the most expert investors I uh, find it really challenging to stay on top of all of this information that's coming out um, and, and actually read it all. Um, yeah. it's, it's quite physically impossible. Uh, and, and that's the, the, the problem we're solving through, through software. Yeah, I would liken it to when you sign up for something and you have that thing where you have, to, you have to look at all the terms and agreements and everybody just scrolls down to the I agree. It's kind of like that, right? <laughs> right. They're like, let me check the, the income statement number and move on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. So interesting. So, I mean, you're dealing with public companies. You're, you're not a public company, but, you know, COVID had a big effect on, on many public companies. What kind of effect did it have on your company and your customers and, and just in general? Because did any regulations or anything like that change because of COVID? Yeah, the COVID has been mostly quite beneficial for us, actually. Um, you know, I not having to provide an office, of course, mm -hmm. and really stretched out our runway in the, in the early days because we did start out as, as a research team, you know, mm -hmm. living off ramen, grants, um, all that stuff. So um, that was, was, was pretty huge. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but more fundamentally, I think it's, it's been quite interesting because our, our end customer, they're investors, um, institutional investors, and there's just been this explosion of interest in investing in the markets. And um, it's been cool to see, I think, you know, our customer base definitely wasn't shrinking 
uh, during the pandemic, while I think a lot of other customer bases were, mm-hmm. uh, which was really nice. Uh, and then, and then the other thing that's been sort of interesting to see is, of course, you know, we're uncovering risk. Uh, generally, risk or often risks that are predictive or indicative of regulatory enforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, but something that a lot of people complain about from day to day is just, you know, there isn't enough regulatory enforcement in general. Uh, but because of the pandemic, uh, for some reason, uh, there's been this enormous uptick in whistleblower complaints. Mm-hmm. So people providing information to regulatory uh, bodies, uh, which is sort of an interesting phenomenon of, of, of remote work. Uh, so that means that <laughs> essentially the regulatory bodies have done have had to do a lot less work and, and been able to catch more bad guys and all, and all of that, uh, which is you know something that's that's helpful for us because it accelerates the feedback system um, for people to see the results of of the risks that we're highlighting to them. Interesting. And and do you think yeah. there's an up? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems intuitive that maybe the uptick is because people aren't going into the office every day and seeing the people that they're whistleblowing, right? They don't have to deal with them on a day-to-day basis. So they, maybe they're a little less afraid to come out. Yeah, it makes you think that, you know, the big reason that people don't do it in the first place is some sort of sense of loyalty mm-hmm. or maybe fear. Uh, yeah, right. I wonder I wonder what's the bigger motivator to, to not whistleblow in person. Yeah, it would be, it would, that would be interesting. Um, thing to, to look into because you don't think about it but but yeah you do see it actually more and more on the news today that little things are coming out that like really so interesting so yeah it's it's been just an overwhelming increase in really? across multiple regulatory bodies yeah I, google it i i wish i had the stats off the top of my head but it just you know i, I think it's like but times 10 something like that wow. so so that then poses a challenge for you for your company i'm assuming because your volume of information has increased, right? So are you staffing up for that? So we, it it doesn't directly impact our Mm -hmm. day-to-day because we're processing the company's filings um, and we we do automatic collection Mm -hmm. of regulatory enforcement and we just use that type of thing to go hey look we were right Mm -hmm. um and and for marketing and and to reinforce what our models learn and all of that and less so um in in what we do on a day-to-day interesting but and you said you started you were in y combinator so that was about a year ago is that correct or oh no that was just now uh Mm -hmm. we finished in september oh wow so you're you're a fairly new company well we launched commercially in April as a company, okay. That's still, um, yeah. but we've been together as a team uh, since early 2020. Okay. And so when you first started, were you, were you, did you have an office or did you all still work remotely at that time? We have never had an office. We've never not been remote. Really? So from day one? From day one. Wow. Yeah. And, and as things are starting to come out, you know, things are starting to come back a little bit to normal. Like, like I said, there's, just, there's traffic today. Um, do you see that you will eventually have an office or you like this model and you think you'll stay as a remote company going forward? So we've hired across the country, mm-hmm. uh, which makes it harder to have an office. Yeah. Um, and I in no way regret that decision. We have are, so the two original co-founders, Suhas, and I, we are based in Toronto and we've just hired two people, not just, we, we had hired two people out in Vancouver and they're exceptionally, exceptionally talented individuals. And if you're trying to rest- restrict um, our recruitment by geography, I think that would have been a lot harder. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, all of us are now recognizing that it is, you know, it is tougher um, to not ever have the chance to just brainstorm it in person. And I, you know, from this experience, I do think from a more macro perspective, um, the future will be some sort of hybrid approach for most companies. And that's hopefully where it will end up as well. Yeah. Or, I mean, what a lot of companies I know are doing, they're, they're getting together quarterly, you know, either like in your case, it'd be halfway between would be like Winnipeg, I would think. 
or <laughs> woo, <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, Toronto one you know one time, Vancouver the next. That's the, I've been to both cities. They're both beautiful cities. I would I would gladly go back to either one of them. So I think that might be the model too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, having the occasional opportunity to get together and let those creative juices juices flow, I think is is pretty important. Yeah, I would I would agree. So where do you see uh, Bedrock AI going in the future? Because you you I mean you've you've built an ML AI engine which can be you know you can apply it to different things. You think you're gonna branch out on the regulatory part? Or do you think you're gonna do other things with it? Or you're not thinking about that yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'm the CEO, and we just have no strategy. Yeah. Um, just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hopefully, our investors listen to this. this yeah. Um, no, we definitely <laughs> we have big plans, um, as one would expect of a Y Combinator company, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but so our fundamental research breakthroughs uh, relate to adaptations of deep learning models to financial text. And those breakthroughs are applicable uh, in a number of different ways yeah. uh, and, and support a lot of, uh, you know, the functionality that we're building out. Are you familiar with deep learning based language models and um, at a high level, yes, yes. Yeah. Probably so, not at your level. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, the, the famous deep learning based language model is, is GPT-3 by OpenAI. Mm. Um, but these, these models are just uh, much better able to understand textual content and context in a human way. And mm. um, previously when working with text, the computer had a really hard time looking at more than one word at a time and understanding true meaning. Uh, but we've completely blown that paradigm out of the water with deep learning based language models. That said, they have lots of drawbacks, um, well, a few. <laughs> and one of, of, well, one of the ways that it's challenging, you know, it's been challenging for the community to adapt language models to, to financial disclosure is there's such a high degree of noise. Mm -hmm. You know, I, if, if you've read a 10K, um, mm -hmm. you, like by page two, you're falling asleep because mm -hmm. most of it's just completely useless information. But a lot of the useless information sounds very, very similar to useful information and ultimately takes a high degree of human expertise to figure out what is important. And, and if there requires a high degree of, of human expertise to dis disambiguate, it becomes a really challenging AI problem. Uh, so that was just an, uh, a, a long-winded expl explanation of, of some of the very fundamental but really, really important um, breakthroughs that we've made on a, on a baseline level. Mm -hmm. um, that facilitate the identification and extraction of relevant information in financial text. Um, and you can see, you know, there's, there's so many, um, there's so much to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, financial intelligence, there's such a need for it. Uh, companies like CapIQ, Bloomberg, FactSet um, are, are ubiquitous and, and are used, uh, you know, in everyday work. Uh, by all of these financial analysts and equity analysts who need information about public companies, uh, but they don't really, they don't have text processing capabilities right. uh, to, to, to much at all. Um, so there's, you know, our vision uh, is very much becoming that ubiquitous tool um, that solves information overload in, in narrative text in much, much, much the same way that Bloomberg did for the numeric side of the business. Hmm. Yeah, and I think your your uh, charter is a little bit harder than than theirs. <laughs> I think it's a little bit easier to work with numbers than than text for what you're what you're trying to look for. Harder but more fun. <laughs> yes, good point. More challenging but more rewarding, right? Definitely. So, well, and I truly wish you the best in that. I, I think it's uh, something we do need because uh, when I've read, I've read a couple 10 Ks and it's, you're right. Um, if I don't have a cup of coffee, I'm pretty soon asleep, right? So uh, hopefully this, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll continue to grow and continue to provide even more and more value to your customers. So uh, I want to thank you for your time today. I know it, it's, it's past five o'clock there in, in uh, on the East coast. So um, you're officially off the clock, even though you're, right. you're always on the clock. <laughs> as, 
like all startup founders, I, I stop my day at 5 p.m. Yeah, right as well. <laughs> That's it. And turn turn off that little thing in your brain. Right? Well, yeah. Thank thank you again, and have a great night. <laughs> thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye.